Hey everybody, my name is Jake from the Umbrella IT Services Podcast. On today's episode, we're gonna be speaking with Mark Olson. Mark is a technology leadership consultant that spent over 15 years working directly with small and medium businesses, helping them achieve their goals by leveraging technology. In today's episode, Mark is gonna break down document management and case management software for law firms. So without any further ado, let's jump into it. And I'd like to give Mark Olson a big thank you for coming on today and talking with us about document management and case management software solutions. Uh, Mark, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into the field of legal IT services? Yeah, sure, Jacob. So I've got a fairly varied background, actually, in a previous lifetime. I did construction and mining in the Yukon. Um, I went to school for computer engineering, and that's basically the practice of programming all of the wonderful little chips and stuff that make up the computers we use nowadays, realized I didn't really like that aspect of IT, so I jumped into network management and this kind of thing. I worked for the biggest ISP, internet service provider in the Yukon for a number of years and did everything from systems administration on their Linux cluster to doing internet services for the territory. Um, we did network design and this kind of thing for a variety of different sizes of customers and clientele. We even, at one point, put in the SCADA control system at the Yukon Hydro Dam. We did towers on tops of mountains doing long-range wireless to the communities to help bring them internet. So it was, a, it was an interesting way to grow up and learn all about the different aspects of IT and the different parts of the industry. In the last six or seven years, I've been working in and out of the mining industry. Uh, my mining background married with the IT skill set certainly helped doing big data projects for some of the larger mining companies like Barrick and Newmont, so integrating drilling analytics with their drilling reconciliations, inventory and supply and logistics chains and this kind of thing, and even doing large scale data management projects for their geological data uh, programs. So all of that coupled with my kind of varied IT background has led me to my consulting big business, McGregor Olson. And that has put me in good stead for helping companies like law firms with their own data management and helping them set up best practices and finding a solution to fit their needs. That makes a lot of sense. You've had, you've had quite the journey to get here. Um, mm -hmm. do, you prefer, do you prefer the hands-on hands work or are you a fan of doing these strategies and the policies and all this kind of stuff? I have to admit, I still like doing a little bit of both. The, the, the policies and the kind of top-down strategy is where I find the, kind of the, the bread and butter these days. It's what interests me the most, but I still find myself every once in a while gravitating towards building a server and uh, getting kind of hands-on with some of the new technology that's coming out, especially with the uh, advent of artificial intelligence. That makes a lot of sense. So when you talk about data and handling this kind of stuff for, for law firms, um, what exactly is it that you're doing for them? So document management and case management is basically the idea that you're trying to track and manage and ultimately store all of the paper that we normally produce in this kind of industry. Um, most of these systems are capable of keeping a record of all the various versions of the software um, modified by all the different users that are have been working with it too. In tandem with that, you're basically doing what's called records management. So it's not just the idea that we're storing the document, but we're also managing it throughout its life cycle. Um, and right through from a creation all the way to its eventual disposition, whatever form that happens to take. Um, when we start talking about case management software, that's going a little bit further. So it's not just the idea of managing the documents that make up a matter, but now we're also talking about managing the, the scheduling, the conflicts, um, all the different touches and contacts with the clients, co-counsel and this kind of thing, and all of the various reporting that's required for legal cases. So it's, it's essentially coordinating all of that together into uh, a piece of software that helps you not just manage your documents, manage your cases, but also helps you manage the life cycle of all of that information. Yeah. <clears throat> so when you're developing all this kind of stuff, 
I'm assuming you're going to have to look at things like resources and processes and all the workflows. Um, when you're taking a look at all of this kind of information, um, are there any unusual benefits that, that kind of come up? Like I, I noticed that when we're doing that with law firms, um, obviously you have the, the benefit of not having to go down to the basement and spend three and a half hours looking for a, a, an obscure document from five and a half years ago. Um, but what other kind of benefits can, can law firms expect from implementing this kind of technology? Well, I mean, the big one is what you just mentioned. I mean, ease, ease of finding the data, right? Mm -hmm. ease, of, ease of searching through the data. So these big document management systems are essentially massive search engines. They've got really um, fine-tuned algorithms that are built into them that help you search through the data faster. Um, the other benefit, of course, is that you've now got it in a safe and secure digital format. So if a fire happened to break out or something, you don't lose a ton of paper copy. But on top of that, you're also making sure that the access to that data is also limited to those people that are supposed to have access to it, right? You don't have uh, an open file cabinet or something that somebody can potentially open. Um, sharing of that information. Uh, there's a ton of paper copy nowadays that goes back and forth when you're dealing with a matter and throughout the life cycle of a case. So being able to share that documentation through an online portal that you can open up to your clients, your co-counsel, this kind of thing, rather than having to shuffle emails back and forth and try and figure out what the, the, the latest updated copy of the information is. And of course, with all of that being said, your quality of data goes up then as well. And the collaboration potential is, is fairly limitless. So all of that kind of thing always saves you time and money, no matter what you do. So it's it's basically a win-win, no matter how you look at the equation. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense as well. So in your experience, is this something that every type of law firm can benefit from? Like let's say you're a corporate lawyer or you're a family law firm or a personal injury firm, um, et cetera. Or if you're a five person firm or if you're a 50 person firm, um, is there a solution here for everybody or is, or is there some people that have to sit out and kind of wait their turn and they're, just, they're still waiting for the technology to kind of catch up? No, not at all. I mean, just about any, any size law firm from one or two individuals right up to hundreds can take advantage of the, the, the idea of document management. And certainly it's better to start early and get in the, in the habit of good data, data management practices. I mean, as, as the practice grows, it's certainly going to put you on better footing. The, uh, the costs that are associated with most of these solutions are fairly easy for even a small law firm to deal with. And in the long run, being able to set up a digital footprint and get away from all that paper, it honestly doesn't matter what size of a law firm you are, it's, it's, a, it's a step in the right direction. Absolutely. And you mentioned the cost really quickly there. Um, is this something that the software providers themselves usually take care of? Is this something where the law firm ends up bringing in a third party provider? Like in our case, uh, when we were working with a CRM uh, that was online, they ended up just taking care of everything for the law firm. Uh, we ended up helping them export and import a couple of different databases from their existing solution. But uh, the new case management software, just they handled everything from start to finish for the law firm. Very reasonable fee, as you mentioned. Um, and it was just, here's your product, ready to go. Um, in your experience, is that consistent or is that a unique case? No, that's fairly consistent. I've run into both the, the situation that you've outlined there um, some of the all, uh, other companies tend to use like a trusted partner, for instance. So it may not be the company itself that's doing the implementation. You may wind up working through a third party that they have tasked with the job of kind of getting the configuration set up and this kind of thing. Um, I've seen price quotes for implementation as well as data migration. Now, I mean, if you have people that are on staff that are capable of that kind of thing, and to be quite honest, I haven't run into any of these systems that are so complex that um, they couldn't be set up, at least partially, by the law firm themselves. The uh, migration portion of it can happen either at the beginning or later on. It certainly doesn't have to be done all at the same time. So yes, uh, in answer to the question, I mean, essentially the software vendors are taking care of all of that whether they reach out to a trusted partner or not, it's all handled all under the same umbrella. 
That's really good to know. And have you noticed any other obstacles when you're implementing this stuff? Like for myself, uh, the only obstacle when it comes to implementing new technology with law firms is the drive, is the actual desire for the firm to kind of modernize and begin leveraging technology. But have you noticed any other technical obstacles that kind of come up? Um, yeah, there's been a couple. The most notable part of the the first part of the struggle, I guess, is making sure that their own internal systems can handle the idea of moving to a digital system. Mm. So if that's a software as a service, more of a cloud-based solution, some of them don't necessarily have uh, an internet connection that would be able to handle that along with all of their own day-to-day -day, uh, tasks that they're doing. Um, they need to have a good firewall in place, this kind of thing, just to make sure that the data that's moving back and forth is secure. If it's an on-premise solution, obviously you need to have a server that's capable of absorbing that extra load. Um, and then if we get away from the technical part of it, like you said earlier, the drive or the, the internal desire to do the move itself and have people adopt it as the new solution is another part of the equation. So making sure that all the employees understand the value of moving to this new solution and why it's going to improve the business processes is just as important as making sure that that internet connection is up to date. Yeah, yeah, those are all very good points as well. Another prerequisite that I've noticed is very, very important is backups. A lot of folks think that just because you, you hire a third party and you're going to move all of your stuff into the house that's on their lawn, all of a sudden mm -hmm. it's safe. But um, we have all of our clients do automatic SQL database backups uh, biweekly uh, with all of the vendors that they use. Um, do you guys follow similar practices and do you recommend yeah. that? Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's all well and good for the, the vendors to produce their security documentation and their backup regimen and all this kind of thing, but you and I know that <laughs> technology fails. So yep. it's absolutely imperative that clients have their own set of backups and are ready to take on that task of the restore if something happens. Yeah. And in case something does happen, do you guys have any contingency plans in place uh, that you use whenever uh, people are starting to migrate over to a cloud solution? Yeah. I mean, I always suggest that they have um, their own set of um, backups in terms of not just digital, but also anything that they're working on currently so that if something does happen, they don't wind up in the position where they're scrounging for the information they need on their own day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. The uh, the idea of being able to set up um, kind of a hot backup with a an online system is a little more difficult, obviously, than if it's on-prem. But if it's on-premise, then you've got the option of either having a hot spare, you can have um, an offline file repository, um, <coughs> the, the idea of having a NAS or something like this set up on the network that they can access the files from. So there's a few different ways that they can go about it for sure. That's really good to know. In terms of adoption inside of the agency or the firm, um, I know that we talked already about having that initial drive and the initiative for the firm to adopt uh, the technology, but how long, in your opinion, does it usually take folks to go from implementing this to adopting it and to thriving with it and starting to actually leverage the technology properly? Is it one month, three months, six months, a year? Yeah, the three to six month window is usually what I see. I mean, the, the idea of getting the software set up, the initial implementation, all of that kind of thing, inevitably it takes a few months. I mean, it's, it's not something that can happen at the drop of a hat. Yeah. And then by the time you go through a little bit of training, maybe revisit that once or twice just to make sure that everybody has all of the functionality firmly in their mind. And then to be able to use it for a couple of months, get all the bugs out, make sure that all the processes are firmly in place. It's generally speaking a three to six month process. That makes sense. Um, and when you're implementing these different technologies and solutions, is there one kind of catch all software that you recommend people use uh, when they're starting to implement case management software or is it a firm by firm basis or is it a category of firm? So do you have one thing for every firm, every size, or do you have one solution for family law, one solution for corporate law, one solution for personal injury, or is it really an individual uh, situation? 
No, it's definitely an individual situation. I mean, obviously, online services, the cloud-based offerings are kind of where a lot of this is moving to. So if a firm is capable of making the move to the cloud for document management and case management, that's certainly where I like to look first. Mm -hmm. But the bottom line is some of them, firms have a fair amount of investment in on-premise hardware and their business processes just don't really lend themselves well to making the move to the cloud at this point. So in that case, we start looking at more of an on-site managed solution. So it, it really kind of comes down to a, a, an individual um, legal firm's needs at the time. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense as well. Um, what, what's your favorite part about implementing all this stuff for different firms? Like, is it the benefits? Is it turnaround with folks? Um, what, what, what is your favorite part at the end of the day? Honestly, at this point, it's been just the sheer variety of different requirements that some of the, the law firms have. I mean, you mentioned earlier, I mean, there's, there's so many different types of law. And even within the general groupings, there can be so many different requirements on how they conduct their own business. So just being able to find that kind of aha moment when they realize how something like this can really improve their um, business process and just have a, a really drastically positive change on the way they practice law and do business in general. That's, that's kind of where I get my kick out of the whole thing. Yeah, I agree with you completely. Uh, lawyers are some of my favorite people to work for. Uh, I always learn a lot working from them. And mm -hmm. a as you mentioned, they, they do kind of have that aha moment, all of them. And I, I've noticed it's because they're usually so busy and so distracted and there's so much stuff going yep. on. And as soon as you can kind of show them the light and just kind of show them that, hey, there's this tool, it's it's a round wheel instead of a square wheel for the way you're doing things. Um, exactly. Their reaction at the end of the day makes it all worth it. Um, yeah. And, and I, I kind of liken it to driving a car and trying to change the wheels at the same time. Yes. And they, <laughs> they just can't visualize how this can be done and how it can honestly improve their their quality of life, I guess. And when you show them how it can be done and how drastically it can improve things, they just they light up. It's yeah, awesome. Absolutely. Well, again, at the end of the day, I think that uh, IT people and lawyers have a lot in common. Um, it's just with different industries, right? Like neither of us yep. can write. We're always distracted. I'm <laughs> just kidding. Um, but yeah, there are. there's definitely a lot of similarities between the two professions. And if you can get either of us to stop for a second, kind of look at the situation from a bird's eye view and realize there's a better, more efficient way to do things, um, it works out for a lot of people. So um, yeah, totally. when, when you're implementing these solutions for folks, uh, I've noticed that we're kind of building out a three to seven year roadmap for these companies with this software. Mm -hmm. um, do you recommend that as well? Or, or have you noticed that it's better to go by year by year or is it better to do a 10 year plan? Um, how do you guys really structure out the roadmap for these solutions? Yeah, I do basically the same thing. I aim for a five-year roadmap. I mean, the, the bottom line is that it's it's fine to try and keep the lights on and um, worry about how things are working day to day. But if you're not paying attention to that five-year roadmap and what the business is going to look like five years down the road and how you need to align the IT strategy with the business goals in order to make sure that when you hit that five-year mark, you're not suddenly on the back foot trying to figure out how you're going to make your uh, your IT jump up to snuff in order to get you where you need to go. It's 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 definitely a mistake in in terms of how you're approaching your business, and this is no different. The the document management, case management concept. If you're not trying to anticipate how that's going to be utilized in your business five years from now, what you're doing now is is not really going to do you any good. Yeah, and I, I love working with people like yourself for that reason, because the way I look at it is they got to the point where they're at now because they didn't have that forward thinking they mentality. Didn't think about it. Absolutely. Exactly. So they need someone like yourself to come in, show them we're going to do this change now and we're never going to do a change like this again. We're going to continuously improve. We're not going to have to sit down and go, OK, panic time. You need a new firewall. You need a new server. Your staff need to be trained. We're going to bring all this stuff out of the basement. It's going to be a progressive, continuous change that's ongoing and continually improving. Um, at least yeah. that's the, the kind of approach that we take with it. And uh, it seems to be working 
not only for us, but also for the lawyers themselves, if that makes sense, um, mm-hmm. because they have become used to the incremental change. Uh, they expect it now, and it's, it's part of the day-to-day life. So um, yeah. I, I do like that proactive IT approach quite a bit more than the, oh, no, something's on fire. <laughs> Grab the extinguisher. Well, and there, there, there's nothing worse than kind of beginning a relationship with a company and having them realize they're staring down the barrel of six or seven years worth of technical debt and that they've got a large, not just monetary outlay, but also of labor and change to how they're doing business and all the rest of that. I mean, it's, it's just a, it's a massive load to throw on a company yeah. in order to get them back to the point where they want to be and they can actually move forward. A hundred percent. And have you noticed that specific industries are hit by this a little bit harder or they benefit a little bit more from this? Like do family lawyers benefit more than corporate lawyers or is it pretty much spread across the board? No, I think it's pretty much spread across the board. I mean, not not to generalize or anything, but mm-hmm. just about all the companies I've talked to in the last little while have all been in the same mindset of how they treat ID and where they see it fitting into the business. Um, it's almost kind of a, a hands-off approach that they've taken over the last while and that's essentially where they've wound up or why they've wound up in the situation they are now is that like you said earlier it's 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 something you need to pay attention to on a regular basis it's something you need to review quarterly or monthly and make sure that where your IT is at the moment is actually going to do you some good in the next quarter or the next year however it looks to your business but it's it's it seems to be essentially the, the same across the board. That makes a lot of sense. And do you have any strategies that you kind of recommend for folks uh, as you're implementing these things? Any mindsets or guidelines that you kind of uh, provide for your clients as you kind of help them transition to this next phase of their business? Or is it just a day-by-day process? Well, it, I mean, it is a little bit of a day-by-day process simply because of how busy the, the, the law firms are. I mean, for them, even more than us, time is definitely money. So trying to get everybody in the same place is always a bit challenging, but yeah. setting up that, that really tight set of needs requirements first and foremost is, is definitely the, the best way to get started off on the right foot, I guess. Um, making sure we really understand where their, their pain points are and any, any special needs the practice has, um, what kind of other software that they've got that they need to integrate with, that they've got accounting software that they want to be able to link their case management software with, um, how they're doing their billback process and how that looks in terms of their document management, and then, of course, how that all ties into the accounting and billing process. So there's definitely a lot of moving parts right at the beginning to scope out and make sure that it's well understood before you start looking for a solution. Um, like we said earlier, making sure that there's lots of staff buy-in and that we've identified any potential stumbling blocks or time requirements or something like this that might show up. I mean, all of those can certainly influence the, the schedule and how we go about doing the implementation. Um, and then right at the beginning, establishing some sort of data champion. So that's somebody in the company that's going to kind of be the, the the point person for the project and they're going to make sure that the new processes and new data management concepts that we're putting in place are being adopted across the company and that everybody is making use of the software in the best form possible. Um, it just helps to push the project forward internally and cements the, the idea of the, the project itself. And then I try and do as much leg work as I can. I mean, like I say, for these guys, time is money. So the less they have to do in terms of the the project itself, the better. I mean, uh, not that it's uh, necessarily one day they look up and it's all completely done and everything's just tickety-boo, but I do try and make sure that as much as possible, they don't have to worry too much about where the project is at. They're getting regular updates and this kind of thing. But... The, the, the implementation and the testing and all the rest of that basically just gets done in the background. And then the last thing that I d- always make sure is kind of top of the pile at the end is the, the training. And the, the worst thing you can do is put together a piece of software, put together a solution that 
either nobody understands, they're not trained properly on it, they miss out on some of the functionality that would have made it so much nicer for them to use, and then if it doesn't get used, I mean, it's, it's entirely pointless, right? Yeah. It has to be flexible, and everybody has to have a chance to take advantage of that training, no matter what their schedule is, so you try and be as, as uh, inventive as possible, I guess, making sure that everyone gets their chance. Yeah. I think that's a really good structure to kind of go from beginning to end. Like we follow a very, very similar one. Um, training is something I've noticed that a lot of people skip out on. A lot of what you mentioned, honestly, is, is stuff where we come in, people have half started a transition and they didn't do proper planning. They didn't prepare properly. They didn't design things out properly. And it sounds like you take a really comprehensive approach when you are setting things up. You mentioned that things like resources and workflows are things you're looking into. Um, what else do you kind of do in the beginning phase of a project? Um, I guess the first thing that we try and establish is where they're at with their, their records management and their data management to start with. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the solution that we're putting in place, I mean, it can be the one most wonderful piece of technology that you've ever seen, but if they aren't actually doing all of the, the best practices that are required for records management and data management now, then that's basically where you have to start. I mean, the, the old saying about databases, garbage in and garbage out, right? So it doesn't really matter how good the software is if people aren't trained on good records management, it's just going to be an exercise in frustration. So that, uh, that part of it is definitely the, uh, the starting point. Um, then, when, I mean, things like a, a, an audit and an over overhaul of the, the structure of the matters that they have now, um, figuring out their document retention policy, um, proper client management, and all of this, uh, the, um, the nuts and bolts of how you deal with data, I guess, is, is more important than the platform that you choose to manage the data in. Mm -hmm. And a, a quick question about that. So we've kind of covered how to get started with this and what it looks like as they're getting involved and implemented and then what things look like as they're finishing up with the training. Now, as this gets uh, implemented, have you noticed that the management costs and the maintenance costs of these solutions goes down uh, as time goes on? Or is this just a recurring thing? Or are people literally just paying the vendor's fee and then every once in a while they have someone like yourself come in, tune everything up a little bit? Um, what does the, the pricing structure kind of look like for companies that are more concerned about cost? Yeah, I mean, that's that's generally what I've run into so far. I mean, obviously, if you go with a, a cloud-based solution, it's it's moving to more of an O&M type model. Mm -hmm. So you wind up with a monthly licensing fee, essentially, plus, but uh, depending on how much data that you're hosting, there, there can sometimes be a, an, an additional charge for the amount of data, yeah. although I haven't really seen that too much so far. Um, and then, I mean, the the internal management of it from the law points or the law firm's perspective should be fairly minimal. So then, like you say, it just requires somebody like you or I to come in every once in a while and kind of two things up and make sure that things are still being utilized properly and they're still doing proper records management. Um, I've noticed some of the vendors also offer um, like three month and six month retraining as well, sometimes even as part of the base package. So they can come back in three months later and give them a quick refresher to make sure that they haven't forgotten any uh, any of the important functionality that comes with the package. Um, if you're looking at more of an on-prem solution, that's generally speaking more of a uh, capital outlay to start with and then potentially a smaller licensing fee per year. Hmm. Makes sense. I, another thing that I quite like about these uh, cloud solutions that you mentioned is the ad the addition of features. So mm -hmm. when we first implement something, maybe 18 months after it's implemented, it could be an entirely new solution because they've reworked everything. Um, in my experience, it's never a total UI change. Like you don't end up paying for one piece of software and then a year and a half down the road, it's totally different. It's more like adding on things to a vehicle. So maybe now you've got a nice new touchscreen and a new speaker system, um, that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. Just in, in layman's terms. So, um, what are some of the key features and add-ons you've noticed that lawyers get the most out of from using these cloud and on-prem solutions? Well, one of the the big benefits I've seen them take advantage of, at least in the last little while, is most of these um, 
cloud-based solutions, most of the SaaS systems have integration with Office 365. Mm -hmm. So having the ability to integrate really tightly with Outlook and Word, um, you can open documents directly from the software and just have it open in its native um, editing software. Um, integration with Outlook can give you everything from literally logging all of your email into the document management, the case management system, right down to integrating your calendar with all of the uh, notifications that go with a, a matter or a legal case. Um, the other thing that's really beneficial with these online systems is the ability to share the information. So a lot of them come with a, a public facing portal or a client facing portal. So you can publish documentation that the clients need to sign or need to review. You can share documentation with co-counsels, this kind of thing. You can even publish an, um, through some of the functionality. You can publish a binder of digital information. So rather than having a, um, a large batch of digital documents to have to search through, you can actually organize it in the familiar binder uh, type format that so many of these legal firms are used to looking at. The, uh, the last thing I would say is probably the security. The security of these online systems is pretty top notch in most cases. I mean, they've obviously had to pass their ISO certifications. A lot of them deal with larger um, enterprise level clients. So the security that's required for the data and for the uh, access to that data is usually pretty high. Yeah. And do you recommend any uh, kind of solutions for people to kind of dip their toes into? Or is it something where people need to speak with you first before you can recommend anybody? Again, it's really dependent on the individual's needs or the, the individual legal firm mm -hmm. needs. There's two or three um, fairly common, not common, fairly well known pieces of software, I guess, on the market at the moment. Things like um, Filevine, which I think you've dealt with, NetDocs is another one, WorldDocs. So all of these are potential solutions. It just really depends on the firm's needs and how they plan on implementing their document management. Sometimes that comes down to the technical ability that they can find internally, and sometimes that comes down to how they want to access the data, the investment they've already got with their own internal systems and where they see that roadmap in the next five years, what they plan on um, turning their practice into or where they see their practice in the next few years. Yeah, yeah, I entirely agree with you. I think that Filevine and WorldDocs are definitely good places to start. I don't have a lot of experience with NetDocs, um, but yeah, definitely just Google searching those two, looking at the features there. And in my experience as well, <clears throat> it's very easy to customize a lot of these things as well. Like if people want features yeah. from somewhere, uh, Filevine has been surprisingly responsive with us where we're saying, hey, we noticed that with the other case management software that was on-prem, we got feature X or feature Y out of it. W what do you guys think about that? And then maybe four to six weeks later, the devs will email us saying, hey, we really like this idea. We've added it in. Thank you so much for the suggestion. So I do mm -hmm. like working with smaller companies like that as well. I've noticed you get a lot more back and forth, especially uh, if you're a larger law firm. Um, most of these software providers are happy to kind of provide extra functionality for you or add in features. Now, that's not guaranteed. Again, you have no. to kind of get in on the ground floor, but they are very flexible in my experience. Yeah, yeah and I mean, it, it's always kind of a, a give and take, right? The, the smaller ones maybe don't have as much um, experience in the space or that, like you say, they may not have quite as many features, but they're also willing to take a look at those features and they've usually got a fairly agile development team. Um, looking at some of the more more industry-wide software like WorldDocs, which has been around for a number of years, I mean, it's got a ton of features, but it's a big ship, right? So the, the ability to make it turn on a dime isn't really going to be that plausible. So getting new features added and having them as part of the, the dev pipeline is probably not quite as quite as likely in the long run. So it, it again, it really comes down to the firm's needs and where they see themselves in the next four or five years, what direction they want to go. The biggest piece of advice I guess I could give them is don't just take a look at the first piece of software and go, yep, that's it, and sign off on it, and done. By all means, take a look at 
the different players on the field, make sure that you've taken a look at three or four different pieces of software. You can always get a much better idea of the functionality that you think is going to do the best for your firm or is going to work the best with the, the current business processes and then start taking a look around to see which other ones can provide that kind of functionality along with maybe stuff that you hadn't thought of. Yeah, I think that's fantastic advice for any sort of law firm. Definitely looking to <clears throat> start implementing some new technologies, leverage these te technologies to achieve their goals and kind of make a new pathway for themselves over the next five years. And in my experience, mm -hmm. if you're able to properly pick and implement some of the software, you're able to double, triple the size of your law firm. You're able to reduce the amount of cost and labor. You're able to improve efficiency. Really any goal that you outlie, you're gonna be able to accomplish that goal much, much faster in a much simpler fashion by leveraging this kind of technology for people. So um, I'm glad that you brought that up. Um, do you have any other advice that you would give to people that are starting to consider implementing these technologies? Yeah, yeah. I, I keep coming back to this idea of, of proper records management, but I mean, by all means, take a look internally first and make sure that as many of those processes and policies are in place as possible. It certainly cuts down on the amount of um, implementation cost that's required because if it's already nice and neatly packaged, then it's much easier to move into one of these digital systems than if you have a ton of chaos that needs to be cleaned up before any of that can be done ahead of time. Um, do your research on the, the products that you're looking at, whether that's through somebody like you or me doing the research for them and pr uh, producing a, a software procurement document for them or doing the research themselves. Just make sure that you're looking at a variety of different products. Don't just pick the first one that kind of jumps out at you. Uh, and I guess the last thing is try and be patient with yourself. The, the timelines for this kind of thing just can't really be that aggressive. It's going to take time. It's a large disruptive change to the way you do business and you just have to be okay with that. So absolutely, let's do some realistic scoping at the begin beginning and make sure that expectations are well understood and that you've got a realistic schedule ahead of you. Absolutely. I think it's so important to make sure the expectations are outlined properly. Um, I've seen a lot of folks where that does get tangled up uh, from a previous provider and when we come in it's okay like you mentioned earlier it's going to be a three to six month roadmap to get this stuff yeah. off the ground and then you will start to notice the benefits midway through that process uh, if Absolutely. everything goes according to plan and it's so important to lay that out because I've seen so many other IT providers say it's gonna be magic two weeks in it's gonna be golden don't worry <laughs> about it they're gonna handle it yeah. I'm gonna do this snap your fingers and it's just done right <laughs> yeah and again like you said you're reworking the entire base of your association's functionality. You're not just going in and saying, okay, we're gonna change the coffee machine. You're going in saying the way that everyone is gonna go through their day-to-day -day life in your association is gonna be different now. We're gonna change the way that you access information, the way you communicate information, the way you collaborate with your team, all these kind of things. Um, and that, yeah, I think it's very important to set expectations when you're talking about stuff like that. Um, have you noticed, uh, for, for myself again here, I've noticed that uh, the clients of ours that made the proactive decision to migrate to cloud-based solutions or migrate to on-prem remotely accessible solutions, uh, they benefited a lot during COVID. Yeah. Um, have you noticed similar benefits? Are people uh, happy they've done it? Did you get what we experienced? And did you get 35 yeah. emails saying, hey, uh, that project we've been putting <laughs> off, can we go ahead and implement this next yeah. week? Um, yeah, all, all of a sudden this has become very important. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the benefit to being able to access information in such a readily available fashion when you go to a cloud-based solution, or like you say, I mean, to a, a lesser extent with a, an on-prem solution that allows you some sort of external access. I mean, it's, it's just, it's night and day. I mean, the, the exposure to the importance of this kind of thing with COVID has just been insane. I mean, without the, uh, without the availability to data like this, you're limited to trying to find a way for people to access remote desktops and all this kind of thing. I mean, some of these systems even allow you to access apps on smartphones and tablets. So you can literally be sitting in 
the courtroom accessing all of the matter data that you need for the, the case that you're working on. It's, it completely changes the way that you approach a legal case. Absolutely. There's so many problems that COVID's caused for folks. And I think that the people now that we've kind of gotten back into action and the courts are starting to open up again, um, they're mm -hmm. starting to really consider moving to cloud solutions. And to be honest with you, th some of the costs involved with getting your office set up remotely, you don't even have to worry about those costs because you don't need remote desktop. You don't need a VPN. Yep. You don't need a lot of these things for, I would say, and correct me if I'm wrong, probably 80% of your staff. They can get away with just using this, uh, again, FileVine is the example I'll use, um, as an app, as, an, as a web-based solution. Um, all yep. of your data is gonna be inside of there. Maybe you need somebody to log in and use CopyTrack, or maybe you need your account to log in and use EasyLaw uh, before you move over to EasyLaw 360. Um, but there's gonna be an online solution for you where you don't need to spend 5,000, 3,500 bucks getting 100 people set up with remote access and buying a new firewall mm -hmm. and changing your server and doing all this stuff. Um, you can just get the ball rolling with this cloud solution now that things are back in order, now that people are starting to kind of relax a little bit. And in three months, in case we do do another lockdown, um, you'll be prepared and you'll be ready to go. So I, I think it's super important yep. that most law firms nowadays uh, not only consider it for the sake of future proofing, but also consider it based on the whole zombie apocalypse plague that's that's been going on. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, totally. I mean, the, I've, I've done some business cases as well, just examining this exact thing. And even though you may be moving to an O&M model where you're paying a, a, a fee per month, it's just no comparison to the, the drop in labor that's required to manage all of this stuff and the advantage that you get for being able to access all this stuff remotely. Yeah, and using solutions like yours and like mine, when you're, ana you're analyzing the amount of resources and the workflows and the procedures that your staff is doing every day, and you have a third party input on that, uh, in my experience, most people are able to cut back, surprisingly, anywhere from 26 to 36% of their labor costs. Um, that's been at least the case in our analysis. Um, and when you're doing your analysis, is, is it similar, more or less? Yeah, it's fairly similar. I mean, if you break it down into some of the different aspects of document management, I mean, there's obviously some things that aren't going to be touched quite as much as others, in yes. like in terms of the the, the physical copying of paper when you're um, doing bill back information, this type of thing. I mean, that's obviously different than if you're talking about being able to produce a digital binder instead of having somebody standing at a copier for hours on end, producing 20 copies of a matter or something like that. So generally speaking, I would absolutely agree with your percentages. Yeah. And one of the biggest things that I've noticed with that extra 26 to 36% of savings in terms of time and labor is <clears throat> those, those employees aren't getting laid off. You're not going to have 26% of your staff get told, okay, go home. What's going to happen is those people that were stuck doing data Freeze entry. Time. Exactly. And instead of them copy pasting things from an Excel sheet to a document or whatever, um, mm -hmm. those people are now going to be able to take their expertise and their knowledge and do higher value activities with them. We, we talked about this yeah. briefly with Paul Sweeney who does enterprise resource planning software and uh, having your accountant go from a beam counter to a strategic advisor financially is uh, incredible and that's where a lot of the growth that I've seen comes from is that's that person who you wouldn't really expect it to come from maybe it's the the B level case manager you know all of a sudden yeah. now that they've got an extra three hours every Friday um, and they've got some initiative and they feel a lot happier. They've got better morale because they're using software that works with them instead of software they have to fight with. They're going to come up and say, hey, I noticed that FileVine does this. Or, hey, I noticed that WorldDocs does this. And mm -hmm. then the entire firm is going to adopt it. And all of a sudden, your three to four step process of converting a document into the actual uh, case management software is going to be one step instead of four. Um, yeah. You know, it, it's always coming from those individual people that you wouldn't expect it from. Yeah, integrating with email is a really good example. I mean, the, the yeah. fact that a lot of this pieces of software talk directly to Outlook. I mean, there, there's a big labor difference between clicking a button that logs an email to a matter in the, in the case management or document management system to one of my clients literally printing out every email that goes with a matter and then having to file it all. I mean, it's, it's just, there's no comparison. Yeah, one of the people that we work for, he calls it auto magic. 
uh, mm-hmm. when he when he figured out this whole okay now I can just have a lawyer automatically sign something and all I have to do yeah. is scan the document it automatically shows up in their cases it's marked as urgent as I mark it and then they just shows up on their desk and within 30 seconds I get a signed copy back they've reviewed it everything is good to go I don't have to go knock on their door and get yelled at for bothering them um, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. so it does make a big difference again being able to remove those additional steps and then just improve collaboration I it, it, the mood totally changes in a firm after they oh, yeah. implement these solutions in my opinion yeah I completely agree yeah um, what are some fundamental tools that you kind of recommend everybody uh, get started with when they are starting to implement this kind of stuff? Should they be looking at the document side first? Should they look at the case management side first? Um, what do you recommend? I would start with the data management part of it first. I mean, yeah. the, it's a smaller piece of the pie to chunk off, a little bit easier to digest. Um, there's still some integration work that people want to do, depending on how their law firm is set up, but it's nowhere near as disruptive as throwing in a full case management system. Um, setting up Office 365 across the law firm, if that hasn't been done already, I mean, the, we've said a couple of times now the, the integration possibilities with just about all of the software makes it kind of a no-brainer to make that move if you're considering going with a, a document management or case management system. And then the, the records management that I keep harping on and data retention policies and all this kind of thing. I mean, all of those um, tools, more, more data management and data process tools need to be in place before you throw a, a technology solution at it. Yeah, and you did mention as well earlier, <clears throat> very briefly, the security of these platforms. So that's been a big concern for a lot of uh, my clients. I'm assuming yours as well. We're both based in Canada. So yeah. obviously we have a lot of concerns when it comes to things going into the U.S. Um, how do you address these kind of concerns for people? Uh, in, in my experience, when we were working with Filevine, they didn't have a Canadian server set up. It was actually through my client. Uh, we were the very first Filevine Canadian-based um, nice. uh, instance. So yeah. I was really proud and very happy to get that going. But again, like you said, in a lot of cases, the vendors aren't going to be able to do that for you. So how do you usually address these privacy concerns for more security-focused firms? Well, actually, surprisingly, there are, are or there is a move to taking care of that kind of thing on the vendors' uh, end of things. Um, NetDocs, as, exam- as an example, has set up a European data storage facility or they're, they're partnered with a, a data storage f- facility. So um, as long as the law firm is all right with their files being stored under the GDPR halo, then that can certainly be a solution. Um, also moving to things like Microsoft Azure or AWS as a file storage facility that can also get around it simply because they have Canadian facilities that you can work with. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's great. Um, that's awesome. Um, and in terms of getting this stuff implemented for folks, um, are you able to work with people just in Vancouver, in the greater Vancouver area? Do you work with folks in Calgary, Toronto? What's your your limit there? Uh, so far, I've got scope all the way across the country. So I've dealt with clients all the way from uh, the West Coast all the way to the East Coast. Um, Toronto, I guess, is the, the furthest I've gone so far. But yeah. it's a wonderful uh, remote age now so yeah. being able to connect with clients <laughs> just like this across google meet or zoom or whatever the platform happens to be certainly makes it a much smaller uh <laughs> smaller world i guess to deal with in terms of clients and how you can address their needs and tackle these kinds of projects yeah it really is <clears throat> i've noticed a big improvement just uh, with my firm and the way that we're able to help more clients out we're starting to help people out in toronto now and calgary and it's all mm-hmm. because what we're doing at the end of the day is very similar. Um, most of the people that reach out to us, I've noticed that they're, they're echoing each other. It's not quite the same problems and the same solutions, but it's always the similar sort of structure and they're in similar places and along the pipeline. And we're yep. able to kind of come in and say, okay, great, you've got a data, ma- data management policy in place. You've got a data breach policy in place. You've got 60% of the puzzle. Um, let's work with you to get the rest of this done. And now, like you said, because everything is so remote, it's very easy for us to just share and, and review everything with meetings of up to 40, 30 people in, in one Zoom meeting or one Microsoft mm-hmm. Teams meeting, et cetera. So um, it's good to know that you're happy to work with people all over the country. Country, Mark. Um, yep. do, you, do you have anything uh, that you'd like to discuss or anything else that you want to touch on before uh, we start promoting some stuff here? 
Uh, not necessarily. The like I said earlier, I mean, the if you if you take anything away from today, it's that you should try and establish those good data management practices ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And if you're currently working with an IT vendor or something like that, that's that's great. Start putting those kinds of things on your your to do list, your your immediate roadmap. If you're planning on this kind of a, a digital transformation move in the near future. And if you do start doing your own research, just make sure that you're keeping an open mind and looking at all these different products that are on the market today. I mean, that there's so much to choose from that it really doesn't behoove you to just jump at the first piece of software that somebody does a demo for. Yeah, I completely agree. I've seen that a lot as well. People jump on the first one, they get excited, and they mm -hmm. don't realize that there's a cheaper, more feature-rich solution that is just right there, just waiting for them to discover it. So I think it's super yep. important that when people are starting to make these decisions, get a good idea, do your own research, figure out what you want to do, and then drop somebody like yourself or myself a line and just yeah. ask them, hey, I'm looking at this. I looked at NetDocs. I think it's really good. Here's my situation. Spend a half hour on the phone with us. And again, in my experience, um, I've been able to show people solutions that are vastly more compatible with them. And I'm sure you've had similar experiences. Where, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Um, do you have anything that you'd like to promote before we move on? Yeah, I wouldn't mind mentioning a couple of things. Um, my own consultancy, actually, that I've been running for the last six or eight months. This is actually the, the second time that it's come into being. McGregor Olson here in Vancouver. Um, we work with a variety of different industries, not just law firms, but I, I've certainly taken a shine to how law firms implement technology and the, the technology that they're uh, really actually benefits how they're doing business. So that's certainly something that uh, I'd like to continue. And if anybody's interested, by all means, reach out. And then I've been part of a, a group here in Vancouver the last four or five years. It's been around for six or seven now called the Vancouver Technology Leaders Group. And it's basically dedicated to developing the IT leaders of tomorrow. So the group basically includes a variety of technology professionals. They're all different levels. They're usually somewhere in their early stages of their career, um, making the move to management potentially, all the way through to CIOs. So we've, we've even got a few CIO level uh, individuals that like to join us. So we try and deliver high value events throughout the year. We do everything from um, breakfasts, lunches, this kind of thing where everybody kind of brings a topic to discuss to trying to put on great networking events for people. So you can find that on meetup.com. And just recently I joined a nonprofit called Builders Without Borders. It kind of harkens back to my days doing construction. Uh, they provide professional and technical services to uh, construction projects around the world, usually focusing on disaster recovery and this kind of thing. They've got a, a trade school that they're actually working on at the moment in Haiti. So builderswithoutborders.com, if anybody has the ability or interest, by all means, go take a look and potentially give them a bit of a donation. That's, <clears throat> that's awesome, Mark. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, I'm going to yeah. make sure we include all the links to those uh, down in the description here on YouTube as well as on all the podcast platforms. And uh, what would be the best way for people to get a hold of you? Uh, email, LinkedIn, what do you recommend? I have a profile on LinkedIn, so by all means, reach out that way. You can also get a hold of me through mcgregorolson.com. Awesome. Okay, thank you again so much for coming on, Mark. I hope this gives people a bit of a fresh perspective and a good place to start when they're considering case and document management software. So um, I'm very much looking forward to speaking with you next time. I'd actually love to discuss uh, the VTL with you and kind of learn a little bit more yeah. about that. Um, and maybe we can touch on Builders with Borders, uh, Builders Without Borders, sorry, uh, next time as well. So um, again, thank you so much for coming on and I'm looking forward to our next discussion, Mark. Sounds very good. Thanks, Jacob. Have a great day. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. And I think that does it for today's video. If you could please leave a like on this video, it really helps us out. If you want to see more videos like this, then please hit subscribe. If you have a suggestion for a future video or a guest you'd like to see on the show, please leave a comment down below or email us at techtips at umbrellaitservices.ca. Have a great day and see you all soon.